Ron. Hello, Brenda. How are you? I'm good. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, showing up this morning. Welcome. I'm so glad that you're here and uh, really excited to show um, your beautiful painting to everyone who's come to our demo today. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, before we get started, Bob, um, we'll talk about uh, what Brenda and I were just touching base on before um, uh, we got online, but you just got back from Malta. How was that? Yes. Oh my gosh. It was, <laughs> it was unbelievable. And at least one of the people in our call today was with me in Malta and we had a fabulous time. Gorgeous, gorgeous location, fabulous teacher, super great group. And uh, we had a, a wonderful time. Five great uh, workshops by Kosha Kuna. I don't know if you know her. She's the um, co-founder of Sketchbook School. And she did a great job. She's just so bright and bubbly and wonderful. And the group was great. And we we ran all over the island. Honestly, we saw everything there. We did it. But it felt like we saw everything there is to see in Malta. And uh, lots of uh, gorgeous places to see it's just a really beautiful place and we had a wonderful time thanks for asking that's great that's yeah. great yeah and we're gonna do uh, a workshop together as well in the spring in Tuscany and it's gonna be amazing I'm really looking forward to it Tuscany there's you can never get uh, tired of painting Tuscany excuse me <clears throat> yeah I know the rolling hills and gorgeous gorgeous really old 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 villages it's going to be beautiful it's going to be great yeah and uh brenda you mentioned uh m graham i'm i've been affiliated with m graham paint company for almost 20 almost years three, almost three <laughs> decades now yeah <laughs> um so on on this workshop um i've arranged for uh, a small palette to be um not delivered i'll i'll bring them with me uh for every, uh, each student that signs up they'll get a, a three color palette of uh, professional uh, size watercolor tubes um, that I kind of handpicked knowing the season and knowing the area a little bit that'll help us with some of our paintings. And yeah. if, you have, if you've never tried M. Graham, it's, it's a, solely the painting, the paint I use. And it's um, one of the professional watercolors that uses honey as uh, an ingredient in their binder. So it's it's really fantastic. It works great when you're painting on location and I think you'll enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think I have one or two uh, M. Graham paints in my palette and uh, the honey base thing is, it makes for a much richer color, right? Does it- That's right. Does it take longer to dry? Well, it, it dries- Yes, it never it never really dries in your palette. That's that's why I recommend you know if you're if you're traveling if you're moving and painting on location a lot use a metal palette it'll adhere to it a little bit better. But just what I do is I just fill the the uh, cake the night before, let it dry, and usually I'm ready to go. But the benefits of it on, when we're painting on location is that you get that really rich and are able to get those really super dark darks that yeah. uh, I'm more known for in my watercolors. Yeah, yeah, you you are. So I just to set up what we're going to see today, maybe you could describe what what you're going to be painting today. Yeah, I I um I just have this thing for old antique stores. Um whenever I'm abroad or uh you mentioned there's several <clears throat> Uh, viewers from Canada I always I'm always up in Canada because my wife's Canadian we travel travel over the border um, I'm always looking for just little odd shops that um, have unique little items that make for an interesting painting I did one in um, Nice a couple years ago and then this one is in Port uh, Angeles Washington which is near the border and I collect when you when you see it, you'll you'll laugh because there's one behind me here. I collect these these toy boats, these pond yachts. And I walked into the store and, and the first thing I saw was this giant pond yacht. And my wife said, no, <laughs> because I've got too many of them. But the setup is 
is basically just a little corner of this antique store with this this boat and then there was a bird cage just to the left of the painting you'll see a photograph of the image i'm painting at the top of your top left of your screen um and that that i thought would be a unique element to move into the the painting and i i do that quite a bit when we're on location during my workshops i will um oftentimes and i'm just going to show you a quick view of my sketchbooks, um, I will make all of my corrections and um, I guess pre uh, uh, design work prior to the painting. So, you know, I'll do a, a quick study on shapes. I'll do a quick value study. And then if I need it, I will do a, a color study or this one here. And that way I've worked out all of the issues prior to going to the expensive, you know, sheet of watercolor paper. And yeah. I, I Ron, find... could you hold it up again? Because oh, yeah. I, I should yeah. have gone to a gallery so that people could see it a little bit better. Yeah, that's yeah, here it is. And and I've found that um by doing this, it just reduces the uh percentage of of failure. I mean, to be honest with you. And I've done it since college. Um, I was an illustrator in college and they always made us work up our comps in sketchbooks. And I find that it just it's just one of those resources that um, I absolutely use every day, every day. If I'm if I'm painting three or four times a week, I'm in my sketchbooks every day, just noodling things around, thinking about new ideas, you know, whether, whether you're working from photographs or just trying to, you know, find new color combinations or uh, techniques. Do it in your sketchbook before you move it onto your your watercolor paper, and you'll be much more successful. Yeah, I, you know what? If I'd made those paintings um, in my sketchbook, I would be perfectly happy. <laughs> I would be happy. That would be good enough for me. <laughs> well, you'll be there in Tuscany, so okay, you'll do it. Yes, I will. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, so uh, this this uh, demo that, that we're doing today, you have already sketched out the outline and we're just going to go straight into the painting. So really our focus today is on how you apply paint in layers, the kind of saturation that you 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 achieve. And that's really what we're about today. That's right. And and just keep in mind those those of you guys who are watching, because yes, it, it is edited. I've edited out like the blow drying of the, the painting. So I've I've dried it between each stage and I'll I'll point that out. But one thing to keep in mind, just you know, if you're a beginner or an advanced painter, sometimes we forget this. As the painting progresses, I like to say pull more water out of the brush and, and apply more paint into it so so you're just developing those layers and layers and that way you you usually end up with a really good value range and the painting is much richer yeah cool okay. all yeah. right well uh everyone we're gonna get started right away and ron and i we're gonna turn off our cameras and uh and also our sound our our um microphone uh, Ron, so that uh, we can hear, we won't have any background noise at all. And uh, this uh, demo is about an hour and you guys are going to love this. You're going to really feel like you're in the hands of a professional watercolorist when you see how he applies the paint. It's very exciting. All right, let's get doing that right now. I'm going to set it up and here we go. So I'm going to first start with a wash of um, uh, burnt sienna and some ultramarine. I want it to be a, a a nice day out, but not like a super, you know, sunny day. Um, I do this a lot with my uh, interiors simply because the outside um, atmosphere or environment really doesn't matter. I'm just using it for the light and a little bit of the tone. So you'll see, I uh, think I just added some um, neutral tint there in the middle just to kind of gray it down even more. 
a neutral tint has a little lavender in it and makes it nice for when you're transitioning um, from like a warm to a cool color or vice versa. I paint through all of my uh, all of my objects. The boat is going to be the main focus, but I will paint through everything except for a little little bit on the top just to show some light. Getting into my warmer color just to put some color on this. That's that waterline uh, stripe you see on the boats. I, I love painting these boats. I have a couple of these little pond yachts or um, toy boats, and I just I just uh, really love the shape of them. I've painted them several times. So I'm even going to knock down the white there, but you see I left a little bit of the white on the top of the boat that's uh, receiving light from outside. But I've gone through all of my displays, the birdcage, even, even this glass uh, display on the right and the glass shelves on the main table the boat's sitting on. I'm just going to go through them. Uh, they're still going to remain light once the paint's, painting's finished, but I don't want them white. They wouldn't be white. Now I'm into my floor with some raw sienna. I want to paint that a little stronger. Through my shelves. If My, my rule is this. Paint through anything that you know is going to be darker. Okay? So I know that the feet of this display case to the right is going to be darker. Um, I know that the shelf on the, um, or the, the cabinet on the left is going to be darker. So I paint the color of that cabinet, a little burnt sienna in there, right into my uh, raw sienna floor. Because I know that there will be a shadow and a reflection and some other details to make that um, blend together. I encourage you know some good energetic brush strokes. Just get them in there. This this um, first wash is really important for the energy of the painting. So if you're tentative right from the get go, then the painting has a feeling of tightness and uh, tension that you know you just will never save. So start out real loose and free here. And um, it'll follow you throughout that painting. This is just some junk that's in the display case and little necklace uh, model. Doing that just to get some of the reflection and to darken my foreground so it comes forward. It's just burnt sienna with a little bit of purple. The, the paper is still wet but uh, but thirsty wet. It's not soaking wet. The left hand side is a little bit uh, a little bit more wet than the, than the right. I'll dry it here in a minute so that everything is nice and crisp. My second wash, I want that to be crisp and and uh, somewhat um, controlled. I'm just getting a little. Uh, uh, opaque color into my burnt sienna and this is just lavender from Holbein this is just the top of the the uh, room it's not thick enough get some more in there I use this color for a couple different reasons one this this is kind of a knockout. It it keeps things uh, somewhat matted and opaque, but uh, doesn't turn them into like a mud. The other way I use it is just straight out of the tube, where I'll use it for clothing or a peek through for a for a tree. Um, you know, think think of ways that you can use it. Because it is handy. I use this and white uh, quite a bit. 
and you some of the details on the window panes. Trying to make that match. This horizontal is important in that if you um, give it too much importance, it's going to distract. So I'm going to try to keep it somewhat subdued. Just finishing up some of the tidy work, you know, dancing around the boat, trying to isolate it visually. Uh, coming down into the wall now. Still, again, everything's not completely dry. It's it's almost dry. I feel like I need to re release a little tension down here. And those of you who use salt, I use a spray bottle and it just creates the same texture as uh, salt, but it won't yellow over time. I'm, I'm going quite dark now. This won't be my darkest dark because the paper is still a little bit wet, but I'm, I'm wanting to get some of those dark lines in um, on wet paper so that it creates a soft dark. So it, it indicates a little detail, but it's not as visually um, strong as, you know, like a dry brush. I'll eventually have to darken this again, but I wanted some of this color underneath so that uh, I can show it through. And I painted all at once so that it's combined, or connected, rather. But that, see, I need to get that a little bit darker. What's happening underneath this table really doesn't matter. I, I want to do two things. I don't want to paint a real recognizable solid shape um, and two I want it to be fairly dark because I want your eye to go to the boat so what I'll do is this this color will be my second color which will show through some of my darks if I tend or if I paint over them I will um, uh, paint with some opaque uh, paint and then you know pull that light out see how this value now just goes right into the uh, display case to the right into this stuff this uh, you know shelving or whatever it is on the on the left hand side that doesn't matter so I create just uh, abstract brush strokes or brush strokes rather sorry um, a little bit underneath the table, just so it isn't this super clean, hard line. Designate the shadow side of this display case. Although I'll have to darken the face of that too, um, just so it reads right. Get some reflections in now from the boat onto that glass surface. So you paint the object first. And this is just a little bit of burnt sienna and a little mud that I've got underneath. This this will be the waterline, the little dark strip. Using a size uh, 12 round brush, soften that edge. Make sure that looks right. 
And now I'll get into some of these reflections, just so it, again it connects it to what it's sitting on. Also get a few of the reflections on the bottom shelf. I'll end up uh, doing something underneath there. I'm wetting it just to let some of that color splash down there so that it just makes it more exciting. That uh, bottom piece here below the, the shelf, I'll get some dark color in there and uh, make it draw the eye a little bit more. So this is, this is dry. I'm going to have to start laying in some of the big uh, structures in the windows. Um, you see this horizontal here that's cutting the uh, painting in half. So I'm going to have to connect it with this, this one coming from the top. And then I'm going to have to darken this. I, I see it now. If you squint down to the photo to the left, you can see um, it's just not quite dark enough. But I, I knew that. Uh, when I started, I just wanted to give myself that th that second color to peek through. This is just my dioxazine purple. I'm going to get a little of that um, opaque lavender in there just to keep it kind of matted. So same brush. I'm just going to soften this edge a little bit. This is just with water. I'm just scrubbing it. I know it doesn't look good for the brush, but, you know, it's fine. Steady my hand. <laughs> I had too many cups of coffee. And then just draw it down. You, you really get one shot, um, but, yeah, yeah. you know, as long as it's wet, you can kind of correct it. Just make sure it's straight. Pulling it that up into that wet paint that I softened. Connect this. A little bit more detail. Paint that reflection that's uh, hitting the display case in front of the, the window. Because that would respond. All these little bits and pieces on there. It's a little framed painting here. The, the stand would uh, send a reflection down. This, this old mirror. And again, use abstract brush strokes to achieve this, not, uh, don't, don't try to spell it out. So now I'm back up here in the uh, ceiling just to darken it up. If you uh, squint down to my photo on the left there, um, you can see that it needs to be much darker. I'm eliminating a lot of that detail and the awning outside. It just, you know, for what this piece is, it's, it's um, not as important as, as you'd think. So I left it out, and I'm getting this uh, fairly dark, you know, mixing my purple, lavender, burnt sienna, and I'm painting it uh, fairly loose trying to get some energy up there. Plus it's all wet, so I know a lot of people are, are um, careful to paint these large areas uh, with the direction that, they're, um, that they want the, the uh, brush strokes to appear. But if it's wet, chances are they'll just all blend together. Why I like to paint them with... Um, you know, it's somewhat of a freer brush stroke, is it just adds interest and energy and maybe a little bit of perspective. Um, you know, think about it that way rather than just painting them straight. I've, I've got to dance around this boat here. Now, uh, the, um, the uh, uh, wall and the window sills, uh, even the signage, I'll paint later in a in a glaze on top of the boat sail, but you know indicating it being um, on the window 
or behind the boat. Since the uh, top is darker, I need to darken this a little bit. And, and watch, this will really separate the window sill part from the reflection I painted earlier. I, don't, I, I need to lose a little of that tension up there. This is just with a the clean brush. You can see some quick, simple brush strokes just to break that tension so that it doesn't uh, drag the viewer's eye out of the painting on that top right. I forgot what I was talking about. Um, now I'm just mixing some uh, warm colors. Same, same colors. I'm using my purple, uh, my burnt sienna, and that little bit of lavender in different values so that uh, the painting has a harmony. It's, a, it's basically only, I don't know, four, maybe five colors to paint this painting. And I think that's important so that it does relate. Now I'm on to this uh, element to the left, which is a, a shelving unit with just some knickknacks on it. And really the main reason uh, I, I put it in here is is not to um, not that I loved painting these little <laughs> little knickknacks on there. It's to frame the boat and direct the viewer's eye. So whatever's on here, if I can recognize it, I'm going to paint it in an abstract way. Trust me, if if I painted something super recognizable here. I think your your eye would go to it. It's just too close. So what I'll do to create some interest, not only you know with the abstract brushstroke, is you see me. I'm I'm throwing in color on top of color so they create that tertiary third color to make it interesting. Okay. Try not to mix this on the palette because it ends up turning into mud. I like mixing all my colors on the on the paper as much as I can. Drop a little water in here just to again change the consistency or the texture. And just work your way down. Some of this stuff can be fun to paint as long as you keep it really simple. Obviously, when I walked into this place, the you know the boat is there, and like I said, I have a few of these, so my eye directly went to it. I didn't dare buy it; my wife would have killed me. <laughs> There I created a darker wash behind this little, I think it's a jewelry box, just so it would pop out that, that uh, top surface. Now I'm creating the shadow side. The picture frame. I left some of this stuff in so that you guys could see how I paint it 
in some of the other videos I cut it out just because it, it takes so long and it's really not um, it's really not what the painting's all about but it does contribute and if you paint it uh, wrong then you know the painting will change and your area of dominance will change that tension we talk about So now I'm just thinking the shadow side, shadow side of this cabinet. It's that little detail. Again, you don't have to be perfect. Just uh, as, as you indicate a few drawers. And the shadow sides, I think people, viewers will cut you a break or they'll believe it. It's the same idea, con the whole, same concept rather than uh, painting, you know, 20 figures or what appears to be 20 figures by painting, you know, three fig recognizable figures and letting the viewer put together the others. If you paint one, they'll they'll usually believe the others. So I'm I'm just painting a shadow side, a little bit darker at the bottom. And then I'll eventually tie this into its uh, reflection. I guess this could be uh, confused, or this this actually could be the uh, shadow as well, but in this case, I'm I'm painting reflections. Uh, not here, but what I'm working myself up to, just getting a few of the drawers in, trying to stay true to my perspective. So I'm being so slow. Sorry. Take some of that off. So just touching the feet and then bam, right into the reflection of the, the cabinet. Tilt this board and just let some of that water and color uh, move its way down through that uh, object into my reflection. It makes for a much more interesting wash. I, I know this seems monotonous, but uh, I'll, I'll move along here in a second start connecting everything. So a little water just to loosen that up. Back to my big brush just so I can get some volume on this thing. Now I started the reflections of this little side table that the boat's on. I, I've said this before and I, I've got to change this uh, philosophy. I usually don't like painting shadows and reflections on objects that aren't there. And the reason why is because you can, you, you can get it wrong and then it's, diff it's much more difficult to correct it than to paint it correctly the first time. 
But in this case, I just felt like I needed to get it in because I wanted it to connect to all these other reflections, especially the one coming from the little cabinet I just painted. Here's the bird cage. I'll move into, you know, here, this isn't another abstract shape. Don't think you need to paint that boat. A little darker at the foreground. A lot of this is about feel. Just how, do, how does the reflection feel? How does the um, shape, you know, feel tension-wise? Now I've connected it to the displays on the uh, right-hand side. Still need to darken this, so I can do that now because I can always go back and darken the feet of these things. See, and by painting these reflections, I'm also correcting lines that may have been a little bit um, awkward or off. I need to loosen this little area right here just by getting a little water and letting it just soften up. Just loosen this up a little bit so that it doesn't draw your eye. See, look how much better that is. It's just a soft edge where... Prior, um, there was a hard edge that had kind of an interesting uh, triangular shape that just drew your eye. And so I'm, I'm constantly looking out how to diminish as many of that stuff as possible. See, now I, I correct the feet. Paint's still wet, it's just this is fairly dry paint, or drier paint. Because I don't want that super tight, uh, hard edge line right there at the bottom. I want everything somewhat soft. Now get back into some of this other detail. This is that uh, old mirror. And if you'll notice that the philosophy of abstract brush strokes, it really applies to everything outside of my uh, focal point. If you're, if you think, if you imagine focusing a camera on one spot, let's say in this case the boat, then as you get out to the edges, everything kind of becomes out of focus. That's the idea behind this. You gotta get that darker. This is uh, uh, some. I'm putting in some ultramarine blue along with my purple and um, uh, burnt sienna. I will mix it here just so I get a nice dark. Check it. You see if it's right. Remember, it'll fade from uh, wet to dry, but I think that's. I think that's pretty close. Again, I'm thinking, don't fill all of this area in, Ron. <laughs> Leave those little bits and hits and misses that make watercolor so interesting. Now connect the warmth. 
Tops warm, bottoms somewhat cool. Really, this is just back painting. You know, you're looking at areas, um, trying to see if you need to add a value so that they uh, pop out or recede. I think that's right. I can also throw some color in there later. To make it a little bit more interesting, but now I have a crisp edge on that um, cabinet here. A few reflections. No, under the table. Notice I paint right through the legs. If again, if they're darker, don't worry about it. Paint right through them. You can paint right into this um, bird cage here. And my only concern is, you know, I want the value to be dark enough. I don't want to paint a solid, you know, flat shape. And I want to. Um, connect everything. So I've connected that wall over to the left, to the wall underneath the, the boat, dancing around, you know, all the shelves and, and etc. And then connecting the birdcage. Here's that bird cage. I almost bought this. This thing was really interesting. I don't know what I would have done with it, but and again, the um, yeah, the bird cage is right there, but. You see, I'm abstracting that. I'll spell it out at the top, but as far as the, the majority of it, I'm just going to abstract it. Now this is really dry. I'm pulling all the moisture off, or most of it, just to keep a nice dry brush stroke, just to get some of the detail. Sometimes I will look at an object just for a second, you know, maybe two, and then move over to where I want to paint and just try to remember, you know, what I just saw in that, in that glimpse of time. And oftentimes it's the important stuff. It's the things that really make that distinguishable. It's the shape of a curve or you know, in this case, the top of the birdcage that is um, breaking into the window. The rest really doesn't matter. I'm just kind of looking around, thinking about connecting uh, some darker values. Soften that up. 
these are my reflections. I'll, like I said, I eventually will put you know, a pot or some ceramic or something in on that shelf to make it uh, not so flat. This is that dark mixture, so it's, um, oh, in this case, it's purple uh, burnt sienna, and I've got a little bit of my maroon in there. This is a lamp that's, you, you don't see it in the photograph, but I had to have something here. There was just too much awkwardness at the, the top right, so I just moved the, uh, the lamp. Nice dry brush. Keep it simple. I need to loosen some of that up a little bit. But I just added a little weight to that awkward area so that uh, your eye kind of moves back into the painting there. This is just water, just clean water. And dab it. Just so, again, it's not, it doesn't have that, um, that tension that, it uh, doesn't deserve. Start doing some of these other little bits and pieces. Super thick. This wasn't happy with that. So now I've got the the uh, dark color, and again, this was super super thick paint, almost the consistency of honey. And now I've got it in. I hit it with a little bit of water, and just let it, you know, go into the the reflections. And I can work on some of this detail that's inside the the uh, display cases. There's two of them here. This is one of those paintings that, um, you know, looks simple and you see it and you think, oh gosh, that, that would be a interesting, simple painting, but 
Now that I'm into it, I see that there's just a lot of little detail that I'm struggling to leave out. But um, knowing that I've got to have get some of it so that it doesn't look so odd. That's where I, I believe the um, the artist's eye or the artist's prerogative is really helpful so that you can, you know, you see a framed picture there, or uh, in this case, this is a little um, a model for a necklace and jewelry, and you can turn it or, or uh, you know, completely edit it out to your advantage, just so the uh, composition works a little bit better. This will make sense in a minute. is a combination of really thick paint on a partially dry and dry surface or partially wet and dry surface whichever way you want to look at it and um, I like this appearance because you can pull away color like I just did where you have a soft you know nice soft edge opposed to a hard edge and it just makes for an interesting variety. Here's um, it's more of that opaque lavender. Which makes a few little necklaces. Something. Again, don't spell it out too much down here. This is the bottom right corner of your painting. And remember, we should all keep our corners boring. At least three of them. So it's had a second to set up. Now I'll get in there and do a few little bits. Kind of reminded me of um, living in in Nevada. I grew up in Nevada, and turquoise was you know huge back in the in the seventies uh, and eighties. And I believe this was a turquoise necklace. Soften that up a little bit more. Painting's a lot like uh, eating dinner when you're a kid. You try to um, Get all the vegetables down before, before the dessert. And in this case, the the boat is the the dessert, and it's definitely what's going to turn the painting into something you know fairly interesting. 
but all of this stuff and I'm a I'm a fan of vegetables but my goodness it's it's monotonous sometimes <laughs> But you need it, you know, it, and one one thing I will say about this is that you do develop uh, brush strokes, you know, in your memory bank that you can um, use later. I'm just saying whether I should throw in some color there. I'll stick to the palette, but then later on I can throw in some little pops of red or... Um, uh, maybe some uh, yellow ochre. I don't know what this stuff is. It's just I'm I'm squinting down and looking at it and thinking, okay, this is the shape I see, the light and the dark. This I do a lot with just windows so that um, you know, it looks like reflections or streaks going through it. There, there. So now let's um let's move into the boat. So now I'm, obviously the sails are uh, translucent, so you know they're gonna you're gonna see them. They're um, they can be opaque, but uh, in this case they're you know they're somewhat see through. I'm mixing a um, combination of yellow ochre and that or uh, uh, ultramarine blue that I use uh, for the sky, and I want the warmth just to kind of bring it up a little bit. Remember, the color mixes on the paper; you'll have a nice clean wash. So I won't end up with green here, is what I'm saying. Is that right? Yeah. There's two, there's actually two sails here. I should know the names of them, but uh, one overlaps the other, and after it's dry, I'll eventually have to paint in the um, the shadow of the other one behind this this front one. Just gonna wait for this to dry so that I can go back in and put in the mass and and uh, all of the supports, the rigging, you know, all of that stuff will be fun. Oh yeah, I've got to put some um, some objects down here so it doesn't look so odd. If you remember how light or how dark I had it, well, it. Uh, now that I've got that boat sail in, it looks some fairly light. So I'm going to darken it up even more. Look, it, you know, I make this mistake. I, I got to be honest. If I could get it dark the very first time, then, yeah, it's the best. But as long as you're going darker... Um, you should be okay. Again, and I've said this a few times, just make sure that you don't um, just color it in solid. Then, then it creates a tension, an unintended tension that's hard to, hard to get away from. Let me soften this up. This is I'm basically just applying a wet brush. Now, if you've got an area like I just had to do here, 
to get it dark enough, then your only other option is to go back in there with um, some opaque paint later and just pull out a highlight of something. You know, there, there's something back there that would catch some light. And if not, make it up. Just a little edge on that. These are the stands that that uh, loader are sitting on. Some of them are quite ornate. I've got some um, that are real simple and then some that you can tell whoever built them spent a long time working every little piece and, and uh, rigging. So now um, some of the legs on the on the table, some more of the detail. This is all dry brush. Almost done, folks. Something's not right there. There. You can see now um, that just with that value change, it really brings your eye away from the cabinet to your left, the, um, the display case uh, footing on the right, and it draws you into the picture. Forgot this little piece to define that sail. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. It's almost like a puzzle piece. I'm looking at that, and there's something that I'm missing, but I'll, I'll figure it out. That you uh, have to piece together you know, what you draw, and then you paint over it. And you lose half your drawing, and you think, oh boy, what, you know, what do I uh, have to add here? That's, um, that's the time to have a photograph or some sort of reference to go off of. So these are just the little cabins and little structures on top of the boat. Just straight dry brush. And I want to run a little reflection on the top of the boat. So I'm just going to run these down. Just, this is clean water, but it's obviously pulling some of that color down with it. So I'll sop it up with just uh, clean water, keep moving down, and then clean it up. There we go. That's pretty dry now, so I can start doing these uh, masts. There's one here. Always got to put the glasses on toward the end of the paint so that I make sure I get it right. So that 
is the second sail showing through that first sail. So that overlaps, creating a more opaque area. Just gonna throw some wrinkles in here. And warm that up a little bit. There. So now I just have to lay in some of the highlights, some of the, um, got to add that little uh, detail underneath the table. Um, and then just kind of look around to see what I've missed. A bit more on this bird cage. I don't want to do too much here. Don't, don't overdo it here, Ron. That voice is talking to me now and saying, you know, you're, you're a few brush strokes away from <laughs> ruining this. So I'm going to lay in some of the uh, highlights. This is just uh, uh, Chinese white paint. And, you know, it makes sense that some of them are catching light. So I'm just going to add a few pops here and there. And then to make sense of the, um, the legs and the reflections, they'd be catching a little bit of light, especially that, that one on the left um, that's closest to us. You know, and then hits and misses. Everywhere, you know, just little bits where you would, uh, you would think that would grab some light. And some that don't make sense. If if it looks right, then put it there. Always corners of furniture, they're always grabbing light. There. Just a little broken light inside there behind that boat. Grab some of this display. And then you can always correct things as well. A few more things here. It's my rigger brush. So obviously the lines of the brush, I'll try to do some positive and then some negative. Do these quick. If you miss, if, you know, they don't uh, make a full line, don't worry about it. It actually looks better. Some will be behind, like that one. And then this, this is just a scratching tool I use all the time and I'll actually scratch out a highlight. So that's what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just damaging the paper. And right here, I'm correcting that mistake that I did you know, almost you know, first thing in the painting. Which you can, and you can also scratch some light. So back here, I'm just scratching a highlight rather than painting it. It's a great tool to have 
I use it to cut my paper, to, to do uh, highlights, some details that I, that I uh, would rather see a scratched area than a, you know, white paint. Okay, I promise we are we are really close here. Oh, I'm just gonna do some floorboards. And you see I, I do these right through the whether it be a shadow or a reflection or whatever, um, that kind of connects and lays that shadow or reflection flat. Pull out a little detail on the on the furniture. Nothing crazy. I like it. It um, when I first saw it I, I really thought that it would make an interesting uh, painting. I wanted to buy the boat but I realized that that was uh, Maybe something I shouldn't do. Maybe next time I go back up there, if it's still there, I'll I'll tell Angela it was meant to be bringing home. A few more highlights here and there, and um, gosh, now I'm really in in the weeds where I'm thinking. I've got 10 brush strokes. Limit myself to 10 brush strokes and then get out of there. Oh, well, I, I can do this. And I can hit the top of that piece with a highlight as well. I usually will uh, pin these to a wall in my studio and uh, take a look at them, you know, it, and just you know, see, see if I've missed something. See if um, I didn't lay the shadow side on the shelves. See if uh, you know the perspective's off on something. And that way, I can uh, make corrections on them before I uh, shoot them. I'm just loosening up that that picture frame. Maybe that's catching a little bit of light there. Well, I'm not so sure I can do much more. Um, it's always the struggle, you guys. You know this. Um, you always add a, f a few highlights, something you forgot. Since I'm, I'm doing this demo, I want to finish it for you rather than you know put it away. Um, so I'm trying to look around and make sure that I do my due diligence. But I think um, I think I am almost there. Yeah, these are um, these are fun subject matters, and I suggest you guys giving uh, interiors a chance, whether they be your front room or a little antique store like this. They uh, have a lot of interesting. Uh, subjects to paint. Well, I'll um, just finish up a little bit here and then call it quits. And maybe I'll take a look at it before I shoot it. But I think um, I think it's done. Thank you, Ron. That was amazing. It's amazing. I love watching these demos. When you go from a blank page, almost blank page, to uh, a finished demo like that, finished painting, it's crazy how just with your so quick brush strokes, you can get all that in. Great job, Ron. That was a beautiful, beautiful painting. And I'm sure everybody loved it. Um, and I've got a few comments here. People are asking about what was the size of your paper. It was a half sheet, so 15 by 22. 
Okay. And uh, Agnes asks, uh, how much water did you put on a painted surface without having a cauliflower? Was well, it just a damp brush? I see you spraying too to get soft edges, but again, no cauliflowers. Well, if you'll notice, if you look back, there, there's a great watermark or cauliflower that I utilize. And when early on in my career, I, I would do everything in my, uh, in, it, try to try to control it and not have those cauliflowers or watermarks. But now I would suggest going for it and letting them happen because chances are you're going to hide them with a, a, a another value. And two, chances are they are going to be some of the best passages that when the painting's finished, that you like the most. Mm -hmm. They just create such a lovely texture and interest that don't don't freak out when they happen. Just, you know, maybe think down the road of the painting once you've planned it, you know, plan that painting that, hey, maybe I'll be able to utilize that cauliflower or just hide it in some way. Yeah. Yeah. Peter says, Ron is so amazing. Four exclamation points. Lovely. He is, Peter. Really great job. Well, thanks, um, Peter. And Lori, who's going to be with us in Tuscany, asks, what does tension actually mean? Tightness in the painting? Can you can you define that? Yeah, yeah. Just how the, how the uh, viewer's eye is directed through the painting. So if I, in that case, if I, if I didn't soften the tops of that um, interior wall where the, where the ceiling meets, then with a really strong value, with a really strong diagonal, your eye tends to move up there. And so I'll try to lose tension here and there. And then as the painting, you know, as I want to create the eye, the target spot, I'll create tension. So there's good tension and bad tension. Okay. Well, that's a good answer. Yeah. There you go, Lori. <laughs> yeah. I explain it a lot more in my book, but um, that's for the most part, it's just where you're going to direct the viewer's eye. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a copy of your book? I should. I, I should. I have, it's in the other room. Um, oh, he, yeah. This is how I met Ron is through his book. I saw his book and it's so gorgeous and I had to meet him. Um, yeah. Here's the, here's the cover. It's a, on plein air. Uh, published by Walter Foster. And and primarily they wanted me to do a, a plein air book, but there's a lot of studio information here. Um, like this painting we just did. It, you know, it was in my studio, but I had already worked this painting up uh, several times in my sketchbook, like I showed you earlier. Work it up in your sketchbook, then move it along to your, your final piece of paper. I think you'll be more successful. Right, right. I have a question, actually. I, I noticed that when you were applying the white at the end, you were taking it straight out of the tube. Do yeah. you not keep white in your palette? I, I don't, because one, it would waste a, 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 a pan that I can add a color. And two, when I paint with white, I paint with the thick. I don't, I don't paint really a subject with white. No. Watercolor white is notoriously flat and, and and actually weak so i i like to you know use it for my highlights or an edge where i just go right into the tube and paint i also do that with my accent colors like my my reds my lavenders my teals if i just want you know extra little pop yeah i, I was thinking it's probably like a really good idea because for one thing my white in my little white um pan is always dirty it's yeah. always a dirty paint, but if I if if I kept just just my white in the tube, it yeah. would be a much cleaner situation there. So, yeah. yeah, and it would last forever. Yeah, cool. I like the scratching out the 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 light oh. with your little tool, and I'm thinking I don't think that travels well. <laughs> oh, oh you'd be surprised. They they usually miss that one. I, really? You know, they catch everything else. They, they've stolen so many of my spray bottles over the years, but that little blade, it's, you know, about yay big. Wow. It gets through for some reason. Wow. Okay. Tricky. 
Um, well, thank you so much, Ron, really so much for, for sharing your gorgeous, gorgeous painting with us. And I realized, you know, anybody who's thinking about coming with us to Tuscany should know, first of all, that that was a speeded up demo. You don't usually paint that fast. Well, I, I can paint about a, a, a half sheet in about an hour and a half from drawing to, to painting. But yeah, we we speed these up and we edit a lot of the nonsense out. There's a, There was a lot, a lot worse jokes in there that I had to pull out of there. Okay. Um, but we, we do this because these are demo uh, videos where a group will ask for a, a demo video where, you know, they, they know that the drawing they know you know some of the the uh, techniques and they just want to see the painting yeah yeah so but normally when you're in the field you know doing a plein air painting it, it's a lot slower process and people would have time to talk to you during the damp during your oh, no. yeah yeah and i and i'll i'll demonstrate my drawing for for instance and then i'll move to each student and you know we'll we'll talk about you know their drawing the perspective you know the issues that they may be having you know before we apply paint and that way everybody's kind of on the same page and and feels good about their drawings yeah yeah i know you're a, an excellent teacher i do have a couple more questions here uh, Mark says, thank you. That was interesting. And Jim says, any more comments on quality of mix as in mix on paper versus mix on palette? Think about this, you guys. You, you know, we can we can mix paint in our palette all day. And, and chances are when we mix blue and yellow, it's going to make green. But when you mix it on your paper, if you want to keep those two colors separate, mix it on your paper so that they... they use gravity and water and the texture of the paper to mix. And that way you can get an interesting yellow and blue sky without it turning green. But yeah. more importantly, and I, I tell my students this all the time, that that mixture will only happen once in, in the history of history. It's your, your color, your mixture, and it'll never happen again. Hmm. Interesting, okay. Uh, Daniel is asking, what are the ways you make connections between sections? Yeah, great. It, it's value. I mean, it, it's it's all about value. I know it's called watercolor, but it should be called water value. You know, it, it, value is so important. So when you're looking at a, a subject and the objects um, that are close in value connect those shapes, you know, they may it may be a round shape connected to a, a bird cage, for for instance connect them with the lines through the value and that way that way everything seems to connect the the worst you know thing that we we can do and we hear it all the time is that cut and paste um look we we want to get away from that and how we do that is we squint look at the values if that object and that object are the same in value they can change in color but in value connect them and your, your paintings will, it'll change overnight, you guys. I promise you how how fast it really works. Okay, cool. Well, I think I have a lot more questions about that topic. And I, I think I, I'm going to have to wait and ask you in Tuscany because that, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, um, everyone, Studio 56 organizes uh, these workshops for artists. And in fact, we do have one coming up with our lovely friend Ron in Tuscany um, next uh, April 29th to May 3rd. And uh, Ron's gonna teach five excellent watercolor classes. And there'll also be lots of opportunities to paint during our cultural activities as well. And he's been so generous to even throw in a bonus night, night painting demo. So that's gonna be exciting. Um, tickets are still available and we'd love it if you could join us. If you have any questions, be in touch. If you want more information, go to the website, www.studio56boutique.com. The pull down is called Travel Workshops and you'll get more information there. And also thanks for joining us, everyone. We have a free interview one week today with the lovely Albert Kiefer, house sketcher. And uh, it's on Tuesday, November 21 at this time, one o'clock uh eastern stand eastern daylight time i forget which we are in now anyway we're going to be talking about his sketches using alcohol-based markers 
So very interesting. I know nothing about alcohol-based markers, so I'm really going to be learning a lot. Tickets are free, and you can get your ticket for this uh, free event at the website under free stuff. Ron, thank you so much. You are amazing. I Thank you. Oh, my gosh. Your watercolors are so gorgeous. Thank well, you. thanks. Any for... Final words for anyone? Well, thank you, and thanks for showing up today. But I can't wait to see you all in Tuscany. Yeah, it's going to be great. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Have a wonderful day. Happy painting, everyone. Take care for now. Bye.